scripture reading this morning consists of two passages in the book of Genesis. First of all, we will read Genesis 37, beginning at verse 12 and reading through the end of the chapter. Genesis 37, verses 12 through 36. And his brethren, that is, the brethren of Joseph, the son of Jacob, these brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, See whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. A certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit, and we will say some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands, and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, And they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh and his brethren were content. Then there passed by Midianite, Midianites merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit, and sold Joseph to the Ish- Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. And Reuben returned unto the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes, and he returned unto his brethren and said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? And they took Joseph's coat, and killed a kid of the goats, and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father, and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it, and said, It is my son's coat, an evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, 
an officer of Pharaoh's, and captain of the guard. And then let's turn also to Genesis chapter 50. And this is the passage from which we have our text this morning. Let's read a few verses there. Genesis chapter 50, beginning at verse 15. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore, fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. The word of our text is verse 20, where we read, But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. We believe and we confess, beloved, that our God is absolutely sovereign. Our God is almighty. And as the sovereign and almighty God, He does what he wants, he does it when he wants, he does it how he wants, and he does it to whom he wants. He is sovereign with regard to his eternal will. He is sovereign in the work of creation. He is sovereign in the work of providence, and he is sovereign in the work of salvation. He controls all things in the universe. There is nothing that is outside his sovereign will and control. And that includes also evils, also sin and wickedness and the devil. And in our text... This morning, Joseph makes an amazing confession concerning that sovereignty of God. And specifically, as that sovereignty of God is a sovereignty that encompasses also evil, sin, and wickedness. What's striking, of course, with Joseph's confession, and we must note that, is that it is not simply an abstract confession. It is not simply that he sets that forth here as you might read of it in a dogmatics book as a fact, as a truth merely. But Joseph speaks of that truth of God's sovereignty over evil as it was a truth that touched him and affected his very own life, and that drastically. Joseph's brothers, as we read in Genesis 37, did evil to him. And now they come begging for mercy to Joseph. And Joseph is a most powerful ruler and powerful enough to do whatever he wants to his brothers. And yet, Joseph says, God is sovereign. 
God is sovereign also over the evil that you have done to me. To me. He planned it. He controlled it. And he uses it for good. An amazing personal confession of the sovereignty of God. Let us then consider this word of God together under the theme, God's good purpose with man's evil. And notice three things concerning that, the evil of men, the good purpose of God, and the confession of this truth. God's good purpose with man's evil, the evil of men, the good purpose of God, and the confession of this truth. Joseph said to his brothers when they came to him, ye thought evil against me. And Joseph therefore does not ignore what his brothers have done, but first of all draws attention, brings attention to what they have done to him. And the word there in the text when it says that ye thought evil against me is literally ye plotted evil against me, ye planned evil against me. And so Joseph is saying to his brothers, this is what you did. Your plan against me was an evil plan. You plotted to hurt me, your brother. Your scheme was an evil one, aimed at my very destruction. You did evil. You sinned against me. And they certainly did. The brothers that hated their brother Joseph and the brothers that were ready to get rid of him and the brothers, as we read in Genesis 37, that felt they now had the perfect opportunity to get rid of this dreamer, get him out of their lives and be free of this brother. And so they see him coming. And the hatred boils up in their hearts against this brother, boils up against him because, first of all, he was righteous, he was godly, he was a pious young man, fearing God and obedient to his father, but hatred that boiled up in them because of the dreams that he dreamed and which he spoke to them about. Dreams that were promoting Joseph himself. Here comes that dreamer, they say, who thinks that one day he will be our Lord, that one day he will be our master, that one day he will be our ruler. Let's get rid of him, and let's prevent those dreams from ever coming to pass. We will make it impossible for those dreams to be a reality. And out of hatred, their ultimate purpose was to get rid of Joseph. It didn't matter to them how they would get rid of him. If it meant they had to kill him, well, that was fine. If it meant they would put him in a pit and leave him there to starve to death, that would be fine also. If it meant that they would have to sell him as a slave into Egypt, they would do that as well. We must get rid of him. Here is our chance then we'll see what becomes of all those dreams that he has. He'll be gone, and it will be absolutely impossible for those dreams 
to come true. And so with hearts full of hatred, they were unimaginably cruel to their brother Joseph. They couldn't wait to get their hands on him. As soon as he arrived, they tear off his coat, they throw him into the pit to die, and even as you read concerning this history and other passages in Genesis, Genesis 42, as well as Genesis 37 that we read, Joseph crying out to them from the pit, begging his brothers to have pity on him. And what did we read in Genesis 37? They sat down to eat, ignoring the pleas and the cries of their younger brother. And then they sold him as a slave into Egypt. And so Joseph reminds them of that. He says, you thought evil against me. You had a plan to cause me to suffer. Your actions against me led to a life of slavery for me in the land of Egypt. No freedom subjected to earthly masters who were again cruel to me also. And your evil deeds also resulted in me spending years and years of my life in the king's dungeon. And your sin against me, your own brother, caused me to be separated from my family and to be alone in that far-off land, isolated from my family, isolated from the people of God. And you are the ones who made all of this happen to me. You are the ones who brought it upon me. You are the ones who ruined my life. Who ruined my life. As the people of God, you and I experience that also at times. The application of the text, of course, you realize is not simply to the general troubles and sufferings that we experience in life, not to the general sorrows of life. The application of the text to us is not to such things as the sickness that you experience and the pain that you suffer and your loneliness and the broken homes and families that some have and the rebellious children that parents must deal with. The application of the text is to the suffering that we face and that we experience because those who are close to us hate and sin against us. The application of the text is to the fact that there are members of your own family who do this to you, your spouse, your child, your parents. The application of the text is to the fact that there are members of the church who do this to you, members of this church. They are your friends. They are your Christian friends. They are your fellow believers in Christ. They are people whom you know well and whom you love, and they are the people who ought to know better as regards how they treat you as a fellow believer. That's what it was for Joseph. These men that sinned against him were his flesh and blood brothers. And not only that, but they were the sons of Jacob, They were the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. They were members not only of his family, but members of the church with him. And they made him suffer. And you and I sometimes can have that as well. That those who are close to us sin against us. They try to ruin our lives, either deliberately or elsewhere, or in other ways, but nevertheless they make us suffer, 
They make us suffer through their lies, through their deception, through their gossip, through their dishonesty, through their slander, through their mockery, and even through their attempts to introduce things in the church that disrupt the unity and the fellowship and the blessedness of life in the church of Christ, and thus with the purpose of destroying the church. And those sins against us hurt. They wound like a knife. I think we would all agree it's bad enough when a stranger sins against us. It's bad enough if, a, if it is a stranger who mocks and who slanders and who ridicules and who lies and who calls us names and who criticizes our faith and who even tries to destroy the church. That's bad enough. But when it's someone who professes to love us, to love you, someone who is close to you, someone who should love you, someone whom you love, that's worse. That's worse. And sometimes the wounds are there for many, many years, perhaps even for your whole life. But the question is, beloved, how do you respond to that? What perspective do you take when others sin against you? Do you hang on to the memory of the sin? Do you look for opportunities to pay him back? Do you let those evils fester and boil inside your heart so that you become bitter and angry at the person and can have nothing whatever to do with them anymore? so that you cut them off and even wish for evil to come upon them? What is your response? What did Joseph do? The key to Joseph's response is in the very next words that he says to his brothers when he says this, but God, but God, you planned evil against me, but God meant it for good. And Joseph, therefore, took this perspective even with regards to evil, even with regards to sin. And mind you, sin against him personally. But God. He spoke of the counsel of God. He spoke of God's planning, of God's devising. And that's clear from the fact that in the text, the word thought and the word meant are the same words in the original. You thought evil, God meant good. And Joseph is saying to his brothers, you planned evil and God planned good through the very same event. You thought of something God thought of something too. You plan to do something? God planned to do something also. And Joseph's point, of course, is to point out to his brothers and for us to be instructed by this in the Word of God that God plans also the evils that are done by men. 
God is behind the evil that you did, he says to his brothers. God is sovereign over the evil that you did to me, he says to his brothers. God is in control of the evils that you did to me, he says to his brothers. Do you confess, beloved, that God is sovereign? Then you must also confess that all sin is part of God's eternal counsel. God planned the fall of the devil. God planned the fall of mankind into sin. God planned Cain's murder of his brother Abel. God planned what Joseph's brothers did to him. And then God also planned even the worst sin of all time. When the Jews condemned and killed his own son. That was all according to the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Acts 2, 23. And so also today, every sin is planned by the sovereign God. The sins of the devils and of Satan, the sins of terrorists, the sin of every citizen in a country, the evils of a president, the sins that are committed against you here in your families and in the Church of Christ, sovereign over every murder, every theft, every lie, every deception, and every bit of cruelty, whether in words or in deeds, there is nothing that is outside God's plan and control. Wicked men make their plans, yes, but always behind it and always eternally before it is the plan, the sovereign plan of God. And the first thing that someone may say to you when you confess that is, you must not say that about God. If you say that God planned sin, then you make God the author of sin. You make God responsible for sin. And you even are accusing God of doing the sin. That's blasphemy. Don't say that. When it comes to that accusation, the word of God itself in our text answers it. First of all this, that although God is the one who decrees sin, God is not the one who commits the sin. That's one of the things that must be kept in mind whenever anyone wants to accuse or to say or to think that God is the author of sin. God is not the one who commits the sin. Who committed the sin against Joseph? Who was it that threw him into the pit? Who was it that hated him and performed these acts of hatred against him? It wasn't God who sold Joseph as a slave into Egypt. It wasn't God who was cruel to Joseph. It was the brothers of Joseph. And Joseph himself says that. You are the ones who planned and executed evil against me. The deed was your deed. The brothers planned it. The brothers carried it out. They were the ones and are the ones responsible before God for this sin. And that is clear also when you realize that when the brothers committed that sin, though God sovereignly planned it, And though God in his sovereign control over all things by his almighty presence in the creation 
and his sovereign providence is the one who saw to it that the brothers actually did the sin, the brothers did it willingly. Willingly. God planned it, but God didn't force the brothers to do this to Joseph. God did not take a hold of Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, and all the other brothers and say to them, now take Joseph and throw him into the pit and then sell him as a slave into Egypt. And then the brothers, as God was grabbing them by the neck and forcing them, as it were, to do this, said, God, we don't want to. We don't want to do that. And God says, but you have to do it. Not that. They willingly did it. They wanted to do this to Joseph, and that certainly makes them the responsible ones for the sin. That's true of all sins today, too. No one is forced by God to do what he does not want to do. God is not the author of sin. But then secondly, Joseph, in his words to his brother, points out that God is not the author of sin because although God does decree sin, God decrees it with, and always with, a good purpose. A good purpose. Ye thought evil against me, but God thought or purposed it unto good. To bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. God does not plan sin with evil in mind. God does not have evil purposes. God does not have evil thoughts. God does not have evil intentions when he plans sin. And God did not decide that this would happen to Joseph and that his brothers would do this to him because God somehow delights in making people suffer. But God had a good purpose, not an evil purpose. God had a good plan, not an evil plan, a good intention not an evil intention. And that was to save much people alive. God's plan was the salvation of the church of God. And that's the marvelous thing even with God's sovereignty over sin. Sin is not an inconvenience to God. Sin is not a nuisance to God. Sin does not come along and mess God up, mess up the plans that God has. Sin never even makes God's plans come close to failing. But God accomplishes his one glorious purpose in all things, even by means of the wickedness and the wicked deeds of men. The ungodly, of course, think that they can ruin the plan of God. And Joseph's brothers thought so as well. And they said to themselves, if we can get rid of our brother, even by selling him as a slave into Egypt, into a faraway land, far away from us, far away from our families, then we will stop God's plan as that was revealed through Joseph's dreams of us bowing down to him as our Lord and Master. And yet, what they actually did in selling him as a slave into Egypt, motivated by their hateful thoughts concerning Joseph and of itself a very wicked and sinful deed was used by God to make 
Joseph's dreams come true. As we know from the rest of the history, they go down to Egypt because of the famine. And they all bow down to Joseph, and he is their Lord. And their sin planned and used by God to make that happen. And therefore, God's purpose of saving his church was accomplished by means of the sin of Joseph's brothers. Their sin brought Joseph to Egypt early. Their sin brought Joseph to Egypt ahead of them. Their sin brought Joseph to Egypt where he could be the one that God used for the salvation of the church of God. And so it is always the case. Sins, sinful actions, sinful purposes, sinful words, and sinful deeds in the church are committed with the devil behind them, having as his purpose to ruin the church and to ruin the people of God and even to ruin the faith of a child of God. And the devil is attempting always to ruin the church and to destroy the salvation of the people of God and to destroy your salvation. What does God do? God laughs at them. God laughs at them. Because even in and with all the sins that the devil commits and that the, and that the devil moves people to commit, the devil and all those sins serve the salvation of the church of God. Clear, especially when you consider the crucifixion of Christ. They crucified the Son of God. The devil thinking to himself in his folly that he could ruin God's purpose of saving his church and the very deed that he brought about was for the salvation of the church of Christ, the death of God's Son on the cross to make the payment for sin. And the same when people sin against you, too. They hate you. They persecute you. They make you suffer. But God uses it for your salvation. He does. He does. You may not always see it, at least not right away. But he uses it to purify us. He uses it to sanctify. He uses it to cause us to grow in faith and trust in him. He uses it to lead us to pray more and more sincerely. And he uses it to work in us by his grace, the grace of forgiveness. The grace of forgiveness. Be ye kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another even as God for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. And putting before us in even bolder reality what God has done for us in Christ. God always has a good purpose. But all of this, beloved, is not simply an important and interesting and a necessary doctrinal truth for us to know, to know, to know in our heads. But it is meant for our comfort. And we are called to make a personal confession 
concerning this truth. That's what Joseph did. Joseph did not simply state a, do a dogmatic fact. Joseph did not simply say something that he knew to be true in his head, but did not know it in his heart. But Joseph confesses it very personally as something that he believed and something with which he fully agreed. That wasn't easy for him. It wasn't. And the reason it wasn't easy for him was because of who committed these sins against him, his own brothers. And it wasn't easy for him because those brothers, in sinning against him, hurt him. They made him suffer. You could say they ruined decades of Joseph's life from a human point of view. Joseph, therefore, as he faced this reality of his brothers sinning against him, faced it from the perspective of someone who felt and who experienced deeply in his own heart and life the awful pain and hurt and heartache that sin brings upon us. And yet he still confessed, God meant it for good. For my good, he said. For my good. All those years in Egypt were good for me. Sin brought it about, but that was good for me. Good for my faith good for my salvation, good for my life of thankful service to God, good for a growth of humility in me before the Lord. God used sin for my good, he said. And not only for my own personal good, but now God has shown me, after many years of wondering, no doubt, on Joseph's part, now he could say, now God has shown me that he has also used it for the good of his church, for the salvation of the people of God. God for good. And that, beloved, is the confession that we also must make. It's not easy. It's not easy. The hurt, the pain, is very deep sometimes. And lives with us sometimes. But that must be our confession. And the key, of course, to Joseph being able to make this confession is again in those words, but God. But God. Yes, he first of all mentioned the sins of his brothers, but then these words, but God. He did not dwell on the sin. He did not look at his brother's evil and did not bring up his brother's evil in order to dwell on it. And he did not allow the sins of his brothers against him personally to make him bitter and to ruin every day of his life, as can happen when we dwell on sin. 
And he did not make the sin of his brothers and did not allow the sin of his brothers to remain in him as something that he would never forget so that as soon as the opportunity was there, he would get even with that. He didn't do that. Even though now he had the power to do it as the most powerful ruler in the world. But instead of all of that, he looked at God. And he said, but God. And he took a heavenly perspective to what had happened to him even from the hands of his brothers. He took into consideration the will and the purpose of God. He took into consideration the fact that the hand of God was in this from beginning to end beginning all the way in eternity in God's counsel. And he said, God is sovereign. God meant it unto good. The God who is my God The God who is my Father, the God who loves me in Jesus Christ. God meant it for good. But God, a vertical perspective and not merely horizontal. And Joseph, of course, was not saying that sin is good. And Joseph was not saying that it is okay, brothers, that you sin. The fact that God meant it for good means it's a good thing that you committed the sin, and God is happy with you for committing it. Not that. Sin had to be dealt with. And that's, what, that's what's happening here. Sin is being dealt with. Sin is being confessed. The brothers had to be humbled. The brothers had to confess the sin that they had been hiding in their hearts and lives for decades. And by the grace of God, they confessed. But God meant it for good, Joseph said. God used it for the salvation of his church and for the glory of his name. as God always does, even with sin. And that was necessary for Joseph to have that perspective. If he could not have that perspective, if he could not consider the hand of God in it, then he would have, not, would have had a very hard time forgiving his brothers, if not impossible. He would have easily become angry with them. He would have become very bitter with them. And he would have been determined to avenge himself of them. But Joseph said, I look at God, and I see the hand of God in everything, even in the sins that are committed against me. God meant it for good. And then Joseph could do this. Verse 21. Because he took that godly perspective, and when we, by the grace of God, do the same, then we can do this. Now, therefore, fear ye not, he says to his brothers, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. The key, but God, but God. 
And so may we also make that our personal confession. Of course, it means seeing God in everything. Confessing that God is behind it. Confessing that the God who is behind it is the God who loves us and is always good to us and purposes to save us. And then we can say, I won't become bitter. I won't complain. Because God meant it for good, for my good, for my eternal salvation in Christ Jesus, his Son. What a blessing and what a comfort to know and confess that God is sovereign also over evils. May he give us the confidence that he is. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, bless us through this thy word, the word of the gospel, the word of life, the word that gives instruction and comfort and blessing. And use it, Lord, to keep us in the faith and to build us up in the faith that we have in Christ thy Son. In his name we pray. Amen.